goats in the mountains? Mm -hmm. Yes, that is what my wife said to me while we were enjoying our vacation. Hello everybody, I am Nick the Naval Architect. And just picture this, here we were enjoying a vacation in the middle of the Canadian Rocky Mountains when I find a little book about a very interesting bit of naval architecture history. You see, resting at the bottom of Lake Patricia, which is nestled deep in the remote mountain town of Jasper, Canada, there lay the remains of Project Habakkuk. And what a project! This was an adventurous idea to create a giant aircraft carrier from ice. Yeah, this is going to be fun. Project Habakkuk started during World War II. It was the desperation of war that asked for creative solutions. Now sure, at first ice seems like a ridiculous building material, except for one factor. Ice is free. Further research revealed ways to enhance the ice, including the development of something called piecrete. Project Habakkuk represents more than just a crazy wartime project. It was a serious study in pursuing alternative building materials. I mean, after all, who says that you can only build from steel and other metals? Where was that written in stone? And so during wartime, there was a serious effort to look at alternative building materials. And even though it failed, the results from Habakkuk can inform and influence our future hunt for better structures. Consider the future of industrial development. We want to be focusing on environmentally friendly construction. That's a tall challenge. How do we reduce our carbon footprint while still increasing performance? I really wish I had the answer to that question. But I can start by studying the past. And looking at our past, all the way from distant to recent history, technology is often restricted by the materials available. So as a designer, better materials mean better ships. And in the field of miracles, composite materials have delivered the most promise recently. That's blending two different materials together to form a superior combination. We need composite materials that are made from sustainable sources. And sustainable is a very key requirement. Now, sustainable does not just mean picking from renewable resources. It also talks about end of life. We need to look at ways to economically recycle our materials at the end. Now that is a huge tall order, and there are not many materials that can deliver on all of the fronts. Even our modern composites like fiberglass, they sure deliver impressive performance, but they require very intensive processing to source the materials, and we can't just recycle them. That's a serious problem. Our modern world builds thousands of composite products, but there is no current way to recycle them. At least, not easily. So here I am, searching for the miracle material, a sustainable composite. Let's look at piecrete in that light. It was a composite material, it's based on a combination of sawdust and frozen water. Ooh, that means I only need wood and water. Both of those are eminently sustainable sources. And to recycle the composite, you just stop cooling it. The water naturally melts, leaving a pile of wood pulp behind that will decompose very quickly. By all the requirements of current material research, Piecrete gets extremely high marks definitely worth looking into. Piecrete was not only stronger than ice, it also took longer to melt. The Discovery Show Mythbusters demonstrated that admirably. They did a comparison melting time between a traditional block of ice versus piecrete. After three hours, the regular ice block had nearly melted down, but the piecrete was just getting started. That doesn't mean we get it for free. Piecrete does still require active refrigeration if you're going to use it as a building material. And the developers hoped that this cheap and 
easy building material would justify the effort of refrigeration. But take a look around. We don't have Pycrete ships, so what went wrong? And speaking of things that have gone wrong, can you believe that less than 16% of the people who watch this channel are subscribed? I told my kittens this, and they were shocked. Shocked, I say. Aaron went into hiding. They are terrified. They think the kibble might run out if you don't support the channel. So please, my kittens are begging you, subscribe to the channel. Do it for the kittens. They need your support. Let's get back to history, shall we? Project Habakkuk started with simple intentions. Originally, they were just going to use simple blocks of ice. Maybe even a whole iceberg. Bolt a few propulsors onto the side and away you go. Not that simple. The initial tests quickly revealed a host of problems with this idea, including rapid melting of the ice. Uh-oh, we need some better ideas. Enter Geoffrey Pike. Apologies if I'm saying that wrong. Mr. Pike was very creative, and he came up with the idea to blend ice and wood chips together. After some experimentation, they hit on the right mixture. And here I'm quoting from source material. A 14% solution of sawdust in water had the consistency of wet cement and the strength of concrete when frozen. We discovered that pulp worked better than sawdust because the ragged fibers of the pulp created a better interlocking bond than the clean cuts in sawdust. Wow. As strong as concrete. I like that. It sounds promising, doesn't it? And this is where the wartime angle comes in. Lord Louis Mountbatten, one of the principal champions of Project Habakkuk, was so impressed by this that he arranged a demonstration. Just picture this. Here we are at a conference of high-ranking leaders, generals and admirals all around. They're enjoying some after-dinner snacks, relaxing in a lounge. And Mr. Mountbatten rolls out a block of ice. And he says he's going to show them something. So he first pulls out his service revolver, takes aim, and fires. The bullet hits the block of ice, and it shatters into a thousand pieces. Oh, okay, no surprise there. Next, they roll out a block of pycrete, and everybody's wondering, what's this new thing? Lord Mountbatten pulls out his service revolver again, he shoots, and the bullet ricochets off the block of pycrete. We now suddenly have to ask ourselves about that bullet that's ricocheting around the room. Suddenly, everybody's very worried where this bullet is going. And as the story goes, it actually passes straight through the pant leg of a nearby officer. Didn't actually hit the leg, no injuries, but there were some torn trousers. Now, of course, that makes the dramatic part of the story. Oh, we remember the ricocheting bullet. But from an engineering sense, that's an impressive demonstration. We just took water and sawdust and made bulletproof armor. Pycrete has the potential to be more than a mere toy. We are talking serious possibilities now. Looking at this from the technical side now, one of my favorite examples of Pycrete actually came years later when the Discovery Show Mythbusters made an ice boat using a modified version of Pycrete. Their innovation, they used newspapers instead of sawdust. Now, either knowingly or unknowingly, this TV show was conducting research in enhancements of pycrete as a composite material. You see, most composite materials consist of two basic parts. We have a strong fiber of some type, and then we have a matrix, a glue, which starts as a liquid and then transforms into a solid and holds everything together. The original version of pycrete went from sawdust to wood chips, and then someone discovered that wood pulp worked even better. The smaller ground up fibers allowed more surface area for a better bond between the wood fibers and the ice matrix. The next step up, you use continuous fibers, weaving them together. 
the longer fiber length creates more contact area and better transfer of stresses between the fibers. Well, what do you think newspaper is? That is formed from creating a wood pulp and pressing it together. So when the Mythbusters used newspapers for their piecrete, they progressed closer to using continuous fibers. That's another evolution of creating a better composite material. So in terms of pure scientific inquiry, piecrete had the potential of a modern industrial billing material. This thing could have been huge, but it wasn't. Piecrete wasn't perfect. New building materials depend on more than just pure strength. Piecrete has faced major problems with creep. Apply a steady pressure to a piecrete block and it will slowly shift, driven by that pressure. Now this does take several weeks, but it is a problem. Under a steady load, piecrete couldn't really hold its shape. Creep happens with other materials as well, usually when they're approaching their melting temperature. It just happens that the melting temperature is a lot lower for piecrete. The researchers only found two possible solutions to prevent this creep. Reinforce with an internal skeleton, or cool it below minus 15 Celsius. Ooh. Well now, hold on, hold on, it's not out of the running yet. We had a new challenge with creep, but it's not unsurmountable. We know how to do refrigeration. So why are there no records of the great massive tests of piecrete? How did Project Habakkuk die in infancy. Well, first, the scale of the project itself just became too large. Everybody wants a super weapon, but nobody wants to pay for it. With Project Habakkuk, they didn't just want a normal aircraft carrier. No, 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 no. They wanted a super carrier. They wanted it to have nine meter thick, that's 30 feet thick, hull completely impervious to torpedoes. And the sheer size, this was going to have a length of 610 meters, 2,000 feet. Now that is 26 times bigger than the largest passenger ship that was built at that time. It required 20 motors running constantly just for the refrigeration plant, just to keep the ice cold. But we're not done yet. We needed another 30,000 horsepower of motors bolted onto the side. That gargantuan power achieved a measly speed of seven knots. Limping along, yay. Well, building an untested ship at this scale in wartime when supplies were limited? Yeah, that's blatantly ridiculous. But before I go too far, all of that speaks to the design, not to the failing of piecrete. For that, we have to look to the human factor. You see, the piecrete worked fine, provided we could cool the ship to minus 15 Celsius. But the humans don't like cold. Ugh, you puny humans. So how do you keep the humans warm and the ship cold? You think, oh, just insulate it, make a giant cooler. Nope. Insulation can only do so much. Your materials need to work within the limits of human tolerance, or you need to remove the humans. But that wasn't an option in the 1940s. And the final nail in the coffin came from the environment. We come full circle back to Lake Patricia, where they actually constructed a scale model for Project Habakkuk. This is how Jasper Canada ties into the story. Nicknamed the Boathouse, this test model actually didn't use piecrete. It only used normal ice. They were not testing the material, they were testing their building techniques for working with ice as a constructible material. But we didn't go cheap. The Boathouse still included a refrigeration plant, reinforcing beams, all the major elements that would go into a full-scale ship. This was a functional test. The question was, could you build a watertight hull with frozen water? Nope, it leaked. Even with the refrigeration plant, small sections of the ice hull would melt, and you only need a small hole for water to flood the ship. This showed that for a ship, the refrigeration needed to go beyond general cooling. We needed a wall-to-wall -wall solution, freezing temperatures, 
everywhere, held constant at every point on the ship. Because any hot spot, any deviation resulted in leaking water. It was a valiant effort. We set our best refrigeration technology against nature, and nature proved the more tenacious. There's an important lesson here. When designing a building material, it needs to naturally stay in a stable state for the expected temperature range. You can't depend on creating an artificial environment or active refrigeration, because nature is always going to win. Ah, <sighs> c'est la vie. In the end, Project Habakkuk never made it past testing. And Pycrete required way too many compromises for a practical ship design. But we can still learn from history. These extreme examples help us to better evaluate more mainstream material science. We can learn the lessons from Pycrete and apply them to modern materials. By studying Pycrete, we have illustrated the prudent questions which can narrow our search for new materials. Some lessons learned now? Composite materials? These show massive potential. It's a great area to focus on. But any material needs to work within human tolerances. And third, don't try to fight against nature. Nature is always going to win. So sure, Pycrete didn't work out, but now we know what to look for in the next wonder material. Pretty cool, huh? This is neat, fascinating science of ship design. But why should this big science only be available to big ships? Smaller operators deserve to have your vessel operating at peak efficiency and delivering the best return possible for you. So check out the website and let's see how we can take your big ideas and make them into reality, no matter the size of your vessel. Thanks.